Hey everybody, it's Sunny and Shar, and I am so excited. I am over the moon to share with you that I have a new book coming out called The Universe is Calling You. And there's an amazing forward by RuPaul. There's an endorsement by Chris Colfer. It's about understanding your in- intuition. It's about protecting yourself from negative energies. It's about understanding your essence and your true purpose and your soul's purpose on this earth. You can get it at barnesandnoble.com. You can get it at amazon.com. I would love for you to order the book and let me know what you think of it. Write a review for us if you feel like it. Thanks so much. Shar Margolis, Shar Communications Incorporated, and Shar Vision LLC do not endorse or offer for any purpose but entertainment the views of any guest or other expert on Shar Vision or UBN. I knew things before they happened from the time I was a child. At the age of eight, I saw a spirit at the foot of my bed and didn't know what it was. And in my 20s, I finally realized I had a special ability that could help others. I have learned that love never dies. There is a spirit world that can communicate with us, and we all have the gift of intuition. Join me, and together we will explore the possibilities of the unknown from beyond and more. This is Shar Vision. Hey everybody, it's Sunny and Char, and Sunny <laughs> is a little angel today because I have an angel as a guest, and seriously, he's a living icon. He's a legend in his own time. I am so honored because he has done more for the LGBTQT community than anybody. Don't forget the BLT community. And the BLT community, which is that? Bacon, lettuce, and tomato. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's he's opened doors. You have opened doors for so many people to be accepted for who they are so they can live their truth. And I'm so honored to have RuPaul here, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. We've known each other for a long time. We have. Was that It was 96 is when you were doing our radio show uh, in New York City, KTU. Yeah. It was, was it 96? Yeah. Yeah, it was WKTU. And when... Had you just started? I just started there. in VH1 in, then? VH1 had just started then too. But I was familiar with you from uh, your uh, columns in newspapers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I I used to be a regular on the show, and they used to put me on, and I would take phone calls, and I would do readings like mm-hmm. I do on Charvision often. Mm-hmm. And um, it's it means a lot to me that you guys allowed me to do that. At the time, and you like, and I, I will. I would love for you to tell the story about when your your mom was pregnant with you. Yeah, well, when my mother, this is back um, a long time ago, before there were uh, what are those things that uh, where people can tell the birth, the the, the sex of a child. Oh, sonogram. sonogram, sonogram. There you go. This is before sonogram. Uh, <laughs> my mother was pregnant with me, and a psychic told her that yes, you were having a boy and that he would be very famous. Mm-hmm. So I grew up with that over, <laughs> hanging over my head. Right. <laughs> and trust me, there were times when I thought, oh my goodness, maybe that wasn't true. <clears throat> I, knew in my, I knew in my gut it was true, but there were some rough times. You know, in my, uh, when I was uh, turning 28, uh, my mm-hmm. Saturn returns was a rough one. Mm-hmm. And for people who are not familiar with the Saturn returns, it is where s- the placement of Saturn when uh, it returns to the pl- position it was in when you were born. Mm-hmm. So it's I liken it to when uh, Dorothy travels all that way to get to Oz, uh-huh. looks behind the curtain and goes, wait a minute, you're the wizard? <laughs> right. You know, it's everything is different from what she thought it would be. And the same was true for me. I was at 28. I was sleeping on my baby sister's couch with not literally not a dime to my name. Oh, my. And it was it was rough. But uh, I was able to uh, pull out of that with the help of people from my tribe. My, my mm-hmm. friend said, hey, get back to New York. Mm-hmm. I was out here in L.A. at the time. Get back to New York and get back to what you set out to do. And what were you doing then? Well, um, you know, I started out my professional career in show business in 82. The first time I got paid for being on stage was in 82. And I was in uh, bands, rock and roll bands in Atlanta, Georgia. Like, were you the main singer? Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I, uh, but, you know, I'd done performing arts school and done plays and stuff in high school and stuff. Right. But professionally, it was 1982 when I got paid for it. And then, um, uh, and then I moved to New York after a few years of mm-hmm. doing that and tried to make things happen. And it got a little traction. Uh-huh. Then I moved out to L.A. And that's when um, my Saturn Returns hit. And it and was, it was crazy, right? It was tough. I, I was, you know, in Los Angeles, no car, no money. Oh, my. I did the gong show um, when it was, it had re- come oh back. Goodness. This is 1988. The gong show, which for people my age, it was a big show in the um, uh, late 70s, mid to late 70s. And then uh, it came back in 88. Right. And I got on that show. I did not get gonged. It's a talent show. I did not get gonged, but I didn't (laughs) win either. What did you do? I sang one of my original songs. I had an album at the time called, uh, uh, it was called RuPaul is Star Booty. (laughs) And uh, I had a song on there uh, that I did on the show called Follow Me. Uh Uh-huh. And um, yeah, I didn't. And the judges on my episode were Salt and Pepper and some other people. But an Elvis impersonator won over um, me. Oh, yeah. So I did. I did not get gone. But I did that. I did. Uh, I tried to get some traction. Tried to make things happen. It wasn't happening. You did everything you possibly could. Well, I I wouldn't say everything. I did. I did what. Uh, yeah, basically, I did everything I possibly could. In hindsight, right. I could have. Uh, focused more mm-hmm. on uh, and, and visualized more mm-hmm. what it would look like. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, you know, a few years later, it a, a huge epiphany happened where uh, I was going to really go for it this time. Mm-hmm. And I was doing nightclub acts, my nightclub act, and mm-hmm. I was uh, doing it in Were sort you- of my, my, my David Bowie androgynous look. Okay. And the epiphany was... People, somebody came up to me after a show and said, you know, that's great, Rue, but why are, when are you going to do Star Booty again? When are you going to uh-huh. do drag and stuff? Yeah. And I, I realized, well, where did I get the idea I couldn't do drag? Oh, it was an idea in my head and my uh-huh. head only. Uh-huh. So the epiphany was uh, get out of my own way and listen to the universe's stage direction. Uh-huh. And I said, oh, I'm going to do this in drag. And... Char, I got to tell you, and uh-huh. this was amazing. Uh-huh. It was like ancient doors opening when I had this epiphany. When I said I was going to do my career in drag, because I had always set out to, I was wanted to be David Bowie uh-huh. um, and do the androgyny <laughs> thing. When I decided to do it in drag, it was like these ancient doors creaking open, creaking open, like uh-huh. I'd hit the secret combination of that's what it was. What was standing in it, my way was mm-hmm. an old idea that, oh, no, well, no one's going to be. It was uh, predestined for you. It was predestined for me. But and I was standing in my own way. When you were saying that, it was like, the, I'm thinking of the Akashic Records, which are the stories of all our lives, of yeah. our past lives. Yeah. It sounds like they were, when you said creaking open, that's the visualization I got that these big, uh, like, wouldn't, I mean, uh, rocks were opening yeah. up. And then you came and you became... Yeah, RuPaul. Yeah, you said Akashic. What are they yeah. called? Yeah, the Akashic records are are all the um, the history of every lifetime you ever lived yeah. or I ever lived. It's all it's it it, Akashic. it has Akashic records. Uh-huh. Yeah, and my sister does past life regressions, and she her spirit guides have access to the Akashic records. So when she uh, regresses someone to their past life. They see what they were in past lives. Mm, mm. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had that experience. No, no, I haven't. I but haven't. you probably, probably, I mean, because you're such an old soul. Mm. You know that, right? Mm-hmm. You're mm-hmm. such an old soul. And, and you know what I find with you, which is so interesting when I hear you speak and I watch some of your, your talk show that you had, you, you have wisdom that's downloaded into you Mm. and when you speak sometimes and I think you don't even always realize that information of wisdom is coming through because you're a healer Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have um, I've come to uh, to realize that and to 
uh, be at peace with it for the most part. The, mm -hmm. the tough part of that is finding playmates who can play along on that level. Right, you right. Know? Because I, other, you know, growing up, I had to sort, I had to dumb down. Not that I'm some ascended master. It's just that um, there are certain. Oh, oh, to put that there, here, and then, then we got it. You know, what's I, the problem? I, I see you as like one of God's secret agents. I love, I love that. I love that. That's why you're here to help people live their truth. And you know, I wanted to know how drag changed you and changed society since it's gone mainstream. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, people say it's mainstream, uh, an aspect of it, the superficial aspect of it is mainstream. But the deeper level of drag is not, which the deeper level is that we're all born naked and the rest is drag. And that right. deeper level is an understanding that all of this <clears throat> facade is just temporary. This is not who you actually are. This is right. just a shell. It's like a costume, this body and all this stuff. So, right. it you know, um, so for it to be for the deeper level to be mainstream, people would have to be able to see themselves from outside of themselves mm -hmm. and be willing to let go of, of, of have fun with this identity that they, they so cherish, you know, mm -hmm. and they get so offended if you say something that doesn't uh, align with their vision of themselves, you know what right. I mean? So right. the superficial aspect of drag, yeah, that's that's become very well known. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the first part of your question is um, uh, was about uh, uh, what, what how was it's it? changed society and how it's changed you. Well, drag um, it has changed this. You literally have changed society with this. You understand that, right? You know, for, for my, you know, being the old soul that I am, right? uh, for my for my nickel, um, not enough. <laughs> not changed enough. Not I'm like, come on, guys. Let's come on. Come on. Well, just get with it. But a lot of it has to do with society and, you know, people in the White House and people running the country and, you know, people's prejudices. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But you've allowed it, you've opened it up to allow this to be something that people, my ne my great nephew's girlfriend was is so excited that you're on my show today. And she's like 24. You have a great nephew? I don't even have a good nephew. <laughs> my, well, his dad, his dad Thanks, was- Thanks, Elvira. That's an Elvira joke. <laughs> his dad was like eight years old when I was born. So he's like my little brother. Yeah. So, yeah. So- uh, but well, I'll tell you how it kids changed me. Are going crazy because they're they're being more open. It's like I saw Julianne Howe say, "Well, she just got married, and she's going, but I'm bisexual now, or I like women." Yeah, and 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 it's like you're giving people permission to live their truth, to be who they are, not realizing that. I don't think you realize it. Well, listen, I, I, I give permission. That's a tall order. You know what we've done is uh, with our show and what we've done with this, this movement is we've allowed uh, people to recognize something that's already inside of them. That's mm -hmm. what it is. Because it's this is not something you have to learn. This is something you have to remember, and that's true of many things. Mm -hmm. What we what we've done uh, with through the power of drag is mm -hmm. um, remind people that. There is more to you, more to them than just the uh, the 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 physical right. superficial aspects. Right. And that you don't have to choose column A or just column B. You can just you don't have to choose anything. You can mm -hmm. decide in that moment. You know, um, our world is filled with polar opposites: um, black, white, night, day, mm -hmm. a boy, girl, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But you know, w when you think of the sun. Uh, going down mm -hmm. uh, and it gets dark at night, uh, that's great. But if you actually were to go further out into space, you'd mm -hmm. see that um, the sun actually never goes down. It oh. doesn't go down. We actually, oh. we're we're spinning around. We're, wow. And that uh, there, then there is no night or day. Wow. At, if you look f far far enough right. away, you know. So you, right. Are you with me on this? Yeah. And that you would realize that the those polar opposites, boy, girl, my everything is actually everything everything is everything if I you agree. stand far enough back i agree and and i i write about this that we're really all part of the same energy Absolutely. we're all really one that we are one thing and i feel life is a school and we're here to learn lessons so they make some of us black and some of us white and some of us female and some male and some not sure what 
sure. their genders. And there's yeah. like, what, 60 different genders now that people can be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think you're 100% right. And But you're also in doing the drag and making it like entertainment. Mm-hmm. It's like infiltrating freedom to people. Yeah. You're infiltrating. I love it. Listen, you know, I, I've said this many times. I don't do this because I want to change the world. I do this to entertain myself. And right. if other people can get something from it, yay, right on, lady, go for right. it. Right. But I don't, you know, I didn't come here. I got to entertain myself. You know, um, I'm going to say this. I'm going to put it on record. Okay. Um, uh I'm I'm real I'm I'm smart. I'm you smart. Are. You're smart. And I, you, I, are. I, you know for a sweet sensitive soul who's also smart you got to hum somehow entertain yourself. You do. And drag has entertained me. It k- tickled me. This morning on the phone uh, I was talking to someone and they had a they they told me a portmanteau. You know a portmanteau uh-huh. is a two words that are smashed together like a spork is a spoon and oh, a fork. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, that's a portmanteau. Okay. Like think Natalie Portman toe. Okay, think right. Natalie Portman's toe. Right. Her big toe. And uh, uh so he said to me um uh uh he, ta- he talked about Britney Spears and he was he's a big fan and he was worried that whenever she has uh, she's a brunette. Right. Uh, we, we have to worry a little bit. And he, he, he says whenever uh, uh, whenever it's uh, brunette, brunette, brun- uh, brun- Britney, I'm trying to put the two words Brittany. together. Brunette. Brunette. Brun- brunette. Brunette. Um, I'm trying to put it together. I can't specifically do it because it's a portmanteau. It's mixed together. But um, oh, um, brunette or something like that. It was funny. <laughs> but it tickled me so much because my brain needs, it needs entertainment. It needs that right. extra smart element right. that goes, oh, this is fun. And drag does that for me. Music right. does that for me. Uh, games. I love charades. I love all that stuff. So for me in my career, drag has entertained me. It has kept me, uh, it has kept me somewhat sane. And uh, because for a high functioning, uh, smart, sweet, sensitive soul, right. I need a little something extra to get through this to life. To entertain your life because That's you right. get bored easily. I get bored real easily. I get easily. bored easily too. Yeah. I like, I, they lose me at dinner parties sometimes, which I understand you do dinner parties. I sometimes I do. I haven't done it in recent years just because I'm in bed by 8.30. Oh, you know what, Char? Me too. Do you know what? The other, uh, I just got back from New York the uh-huh. other day. And mm-hmm. when I, I went to bed at 6.30 in the evening... You need to do that. I went to bed at 6.30. The next day, I went to bed at 7. Mm-hmm. And then last night, I think I, I went back on schedule. I went to bed at uh, I went to bed at 9. But usually I'm in bed like 8.30, something well, like so that. So what else makes you happy? Sleep? Uh, you happy? No, no. I don't need a lot of sleep. I, will, I, I, woke, I woke up uh, this morning at uh, 1.30. Oh, wow. I had, to, I had to call Europe to make some plans because we're going there for blah, blah, blah. But Wait, wait, uh, wait. You're doing DragCon in, in England, in right? In England, yes. That's we're doing DragCon. That's so exciting. DragCon, and we have uh, uh, Drag Race UK, which starts up October 3rd, uh, 2019. So exciting. Yeah, so we're doing all that. But um, George and I are going to go over there. I'm working, but... And George is... George is my husband. Your husband. And we're going to go over there and have a little vacation uh, time also. So I was what, making arrangements with the What's your relationship like with George? He's my favorite person I've ever met on this planet. Yeah? My favorite person. And I... My goodness. He tickles me, and he is a lovely, lovely, kind person and he has he has an artist's brain so he thinks outside the box and we are so compatible wow we we, and and i he doesn't have to there's not and i'm a skeptic i'm scorpio i'm a skeptic skeptic oh you're scorpio Uh, yeah i there's not one bone in my body that um that would think that he uh doesn't love me every with everything i feel i feel his love for me your soulmates yeah, he You're he's truly great. soulmates. Yeah. How did you guys meet? We met on the dance floor at Limelight Disco in New York City. My when how long ago was that? In ninety four. I was there, um I was there uh with a friend and I looked out on the dance floor and I saw this he's six seven in stocking feet. But H- how tall are you? I'm six four. <laughs> oh yeah. My goodness. And he had on 
Uh, he had on these huge platforms, uh-huh. so he was even taller and dancing like a maniac. So I, in the middle, I went over to him on the dance floor and I said, "What are you doing? <laughs> what?" I said, "Can I put my arms around?" Because I never get to sort of put my arms around someone taller than me. Oh, so I said, I "Can never I thought put, of that?" Yeah. So I, I said, "Can I put my arms around you and give you a hug?" He said, "Sure." And then he lifted me up. He, he, I put my arms around his neck, and then he put his arms around my waist, Aww. and he lifted me up. I've never had that sensation before. Aww. And that was it. And that was it. Yeah. And that was 94. And did you just start calling each other every day? Well, or? from that, that night, we went out. We, went, we left there and went to, to, to get something to eat at Florent. In uh, the in the West mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Village, which is mm-hmm. actually where near where we live now, <clears throat> we've had this uh, um, this place in uh, in the West Village for twenty five years. Oh, how nice! Yeah, yeah, and um, uh, it's like a neighborhood, isn't it? Oh, it's lovely. It's it's because the West Village in New York is off the grid because most of the city is on a grid, you know, mm-hmm. blocks and blocks. But because it's the oldest part of the city, you know, on the west of uh, of Eighth actually west of 7th Avenue, it's all off the grid. It's all, um, it's a different configuration. So what would you guys do on a Sunday morning? Well, on a Sunday, this past Sunday morning, uh-huh. we were there. Um, I got up, because I get up early. Right. I, I love Sunday mornings in New York. I love Sunday mornings Usually we too. will um, get on the bicycles and ride around because there's no traffic. Okay, so you have bicycles there. Yes, yeah. Okay. And then... Um, uh, and it's safe. And it's very safe because there's just no one on the street. Right. So we're talking... Five o'clock in the morning, the Amazing. sun's coming up. Yeah, so I first of all, I'll I'll um, get on my Starbucks app and and uh, go get the oatmeal and uh, quad lattes, um, uh-huh. <laughs> and bring them back, and then we'll go for a bike ride. Uh-huh. Um, we'll lay in bed and just you know uh, hold each other. Aww. And um, what did we do this after? Sunday? How many years is this? Twenty five years. It's um, actually we met. We met in January of '94. Uh huh. So I, I I I don't know math. Okay, uh, but that I was don't a long either. time it's ago. A long time yeah, ago. Yeah. Okay. And uh uh so and and we got the apartment. Actually, we got the apartment in January of '95. I remember because I just uh, signed a contract with Mac Cosmetics. Wow. And that's that's what I did with my. <laughs> My Aww. advance is I bought an apartment. Aww. So um, so anyway, George is, is lovely and, and um, uh, he has a, he has a ranch and, in Wyoming. He's Australian. Oh, he's Australian. Yeah. Do you yeah. have horses? No. Uh, let, me, let me explain to everyone out there that what a modern ranch is today. Okay. And I Because we all have a different idea of it because of movies and westerns and right? probably the TV show Bonanza. Um, right. But every time I mention that he has a ranch in Wyoming. Right. When someone comes back to me and says, so how's George with the ranch in Montana? <laughs> I swear, without <laughs> fail, without everyone, everyone says Montana, even though I've it's never- It's Wyoming. It's Wyoming. And I think that's because of movies and television also. I think you're probably right. I'm, t- I'm telling you. people have a stereotype. Yeah. Without fail. It's, it's wild and uncanny. They always say Montana. Anyway- um, this ranch, which is sixty thousand acres, when I did sixty thousand acres, sixty thousand acres, I did an interview with Oprah. Um, where are they now? Several years ago. Oh my goodness! And I said, um, yes. Well, my, uh, my husband has a, a fifty-acre ranch in Wyoming. Well, um, <laughs> George <laughs> had a. You have to. Yeah. I don't know what I'm that, doing. That wrong. part right there. Yes. Yeah. It's not. Oh, I see. You've twisted your I microphone. Don't know what I did. Here, let I me did, help. Thank I you. Know how to do this. RuPaul yeah. is now my technician. Yeah. He's fixing. Please stand by. That's the mic. Okay, you thank you, sweetie. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, uh, and I, I mistakenly said George had a 50-acre ranch, but it was it's actually 60,000 acres. 60,000 acres. Math and so, numbers, not so my So what kind suit. of wild animals are on a, on a property like that? Because I'm very into nature. All of them are there. So there's deer. Is there uh, antelope? Everything, antelope. Uh, ra- yeah, ra- um, 
raptors, uh, wow. you name it. Um, the dogs got in, in a, a scuttle with a porcupine two weeks ago. Oh, no. So Are they, they got, okay? Uh, well, yeah. One of them uh, got into the scuttle and had to go to the vet and, and be anesthetized to have the the porcupine needles taken oh no. out. Oh, that's horrible. Because it was in, it was in uh, her nose. Oh, I'm so sad. Anyway, so but um, a modern ranch is land management. It's not right. like Bonanza. It's land management. So he sells um, water to the oil companies. He leases the mineral rights to the wow. oil companies. Wow. He um, leases uh, uh, pastures for ranchers to for their cattle to graze on the land Mm -hmm. and because wyoming is very old-fashioned and republican and all that um wind farms have had a hard time getting started there right right Um, oh are they doing wind farms there is a company doing them in i think it's in uh in um laramie but um he hasn't been able to get it done on his property yet and do you do you have wells there are you wells. You have like you have artesian wells and like fresh, amazing water. A fresh, amazing water, and he um, he sells that. So see, I yeah. think that that is going to be the most needed commodity in the future. Yeah. it's not oil. It's going to be water. I, I, I we need water. We, we need water. Need so he better hang on to that place. Yeah. Well, he 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 inherited it from his father was American, uh, mm-hmm. his mother uh, Australian. He was born in Australia, mm-hmm. and he's had the ranch for for ten years. Do, like, do you have in laws? I do have in laws. Yes. Yep. And they're in all in Australia. And do they? Do you, do you like them? I do. I do <laughs> like them. Um, I do. Uh, they're they're wonderful. In fact, when I do an Australian accent, I'm doing uh, George's sister. Oh, that's good. Uh, her name is Chicky, and she uh, she speaks like this. Uh huh. And that's uh, so I can't I can't do a man's Australian accent. And I can only do Chicky Chiquita. And and where where in Australia? Perth, Australia. It's the most. Oh, remote, I've been there. I've been yeah, there. The most remote city in the world it's beautiful it's i beautiful. love perth i love perth it's great uh now george of course has a different opinion of perth oh, but because he grew up yeah there. he grew up there but uh you know it's funny i'm from san diego born and raised and perth and san diego are pretty much the same city right yeah yeah they're so similar the way they look even just right. values you know that's Okay, so you have a sister-in-law, and you ha- do you have a mother-in-law? Do you- yes, mother-in-law. Um, uh, he, um, George uh, has, uh, he had, uh, there were six of them. Uh, yeah. uh, one of the sisters uh, has gone on, uh, oh. but uh, uh, he's got several um, sisters still with us and a brother. And uh, yeah, he's, um, uh, yeah he's, he's absolutely lovely. He left there when he was 17 to go to Paris. To go to, um, uh, 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 you know, fashion school. And then oh. when I met him in New York, he was at FIT. It sounds so beautiful because it sounds like you are, like you're together, but you also have your freedom to be who exactly oh, yeah. who you are in your lives. Yeah. And you support each other. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a gift. It is a gift. And I, I, I never take it for granted. Absolutely. Listen, we've had our ups and downs. Right. Had After all, since nineteen ninety four. Yeah. But but you but did you go to therapy to work it out together? We have before. Or? We um we we got sober together, which was a huge oh, part wow. of our of our story. And uh, you know, we split up for a while. We we've had our. Oh no. We have. Yeah, we've done. Oh it all. my goodness, that was, must have been heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking, but you know what? Um, uh, still couldn't shake him. Could not shake him. We no. even when we were apart, uh, we spoke every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really adorable. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. Uh, wait, what sign is he? He's Aquarius. Oh, okay. We actually met on his birthday on uh, oh. January twenty fourth. You were his gift. Yeah, and we got married on his birthday. Oh. Uh, you know, we got married just a few years ago. Where? Uh, in our house here in L.A. 
Who officiated the wedding? Uh, Alicia. You know, from Alicia from our television. From Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. She did it. How beautiful. So it was Alicia and her husband, Ed, who's worked at World of Wonder. Ed has been there the longest, I believe. Ed has been at World of Wonder for uh, maybe... 24 25 years maybe wow and then um and their their little girl uh uh brianna Aww. was there our it was just the five of us in our living room oh that's so special yeah and george and i wore our pajamas okay that is adorable <laughs> do you have photos i don't think we do i don't think we oh do. no photos it was very very informal in fact um George and I went down to the courthouse and got the papers, and then wow. we had the ceremony. But I think for anybody who's out there uh, who's thinking of getting married, yeah. the, the, the key to that is to have a small ceremony on yeah. one day okay. and then have uh, a reception on another day. I think putting both of those uh, uh, ceremonies together, the reception and the, the ceremony, the wedding, is too much and it costs too much money and it right. also if you have to move from one place to the next i say have a small wedding of just a handful of family and friends right in your house in your backyard and then plan another day for a a, a big party to invite everyone <laughs> so you were in your pajamas yeah then you kicked everybody out and you had your honeymoon yes well with the honeymoon's <laughs> been going on for many years but uh, we, we didn't really have to kick them out because there's only three of them, two adults and a child. <laughs> so they just went home. So sweet. And and was George at Studio 54? Because I know you were at Studio 54. Well, no, I was at Studio 54 way after the fact. Oh, way after the oh, fact. Okay. When it reopened in the 80s or something like oh, that. Oh, okay. Because we had a party at KTU at Studio 54. This is... Um, this is... Uh, in the in the in the nineties, yeah. Right. But I came to New York the first time in uh, eighty two with my band from Atlanta. Oh, okay. And then uh, and then I moved to New York in eighty four, and stayed there for about six months before the city spit me back out, and I went back to Atlanta. Then right. I came back to New York in November of eighty seven, mm -hmm. and I've been there ever since. And did you know Andy Warhol and all those? No, people? I would see him at a party. I, I'd see him at parties, but mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I never officially met him or anything. But you know, all of the kids who had come to New York, like myself, um, we all came to New York because we grew up reading Interview magazine, mm -hmm. and because of the Warhol superstars who had come to New York, changed their names, and created. Uh, an identity, a life for themselves mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't the small town kid from wherever. Right. And we all moved there because of him and David Bowie. Those were the two things. Andy Warhol and David Bowie. Those were the things that propelled right. all of us kids my age. I'm, right. I'm going to be 59 next in, in November. You look fabulous, well, darling. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you really look fabulous. Thank you. He really does. Well, um, all of the people my age, we came to New York. We missed the Studio 54, but we read about it, and that's why we came to New York. Okay. You know? Yeah. And now, so. Wow. I mean, that's history. It is. It that's really history. Is. You're part of history. Yeah. And you've taken all that knowledge, and you've. And how. What gave you the idea to do Drag Race? Well, Drag Race. Uh, uh, my friends um, who I met in the East Village, same. We're all the same age. Uh, uh, Randy and Fenton, who run World of Wonder. Yes, I work with them. Yes. Well, I met them in 1985 at the Marriott Marquis mm -hmm. in Times Square. There was a uh, festival, a, a seminar called the New Music, uh, the New Music Seminar. Is that what it's called? New Music Seminar. Yeah, New Music Seminar. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I met them, at, and it was this was held yearly at the uh, Marriott Marquis in Times Square. So I met them there. And uh, when I met Randy, yeah, uh, I actually uh, Fenton I met later, but Randy was there, and he looked at me in the eyes, yeah, and I could see reflected back in his eyes everything that I could be in that moment. Okay, so your you, there was like a mirror soul, yes, like yeah. a soulmate in a way. That's right. Uh, everything I could be, everything I am today, yeah, all the things you just talked about, yeah. I could see reflected back in his eyes. And I and I had never experienced that before. In that moment. In that moment. He saw it. He saw it. 
he saw it. And I was taken aback. And I thought, follow this guy. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, don't let this one go. He could see it. And to this, I could, I remember the look in his eye. He still gives me that look today, by the he way. He does? Yes. And um, so uh, uh, a year later, they produced an album on me, that one called RuPaul is Star Booty. Right. And then um, we remained friends. And uh, in 91, after... I um, came back to, uh, I'd come back to New York. I remember I was in, I was in, in 88, mm-hmm. I was in LA mm-hmm. sleeping on my sister's couch. At Christmas mm-hmm. time I was, of 88, I was at my mother's house, uh, you know, and I, I had just, I was depressed. I sort of, I needed a breather. Um, in January of 89, Larry T, another one of my, tribe members and i talk about my uh, finding your tribe all the time you do to talk about it and you have found your tribe i have found chosen your family that's right and so larry t called me up from new york in san diego and he said what are you doing get your ass back here to new york i will buy you a ticket Uh. you will pay me back in a week you know one (laughs) go-go gig because i used to go-go dance on Uh the bar at the pyramid club in new york oh my goodness was that exhausting no it was fun it was so much fun i get i get energy from dancing uh well you can dance i love it i love it so he called he got he paid for a ticket i went back to new york i said you know what i'm gonna go back to new york i'm gonna let these bitches have it so uh-huh. i decided i'm going to give them drag they want drag. Right. i'm going to give them drag right i got back to new york in january and by by september of 89 i had been i was crowned the queen of manhattan amazing this was uh and this is in what nine months uh seven months i don't know amazing so so by the end so my reign as the queen of manhattan mm-hmm. ended in September of 1990. This was uh-huh. an annual thing that they would do, the clubs and stuff. Right. So by the 1990, I thought, you know what? I'm going to go for it in a bigger way. So we're September 1990. Yeah. By December, I decided, you know, I'm going to quit um, quit doing chemicals. I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to only smoke weed. And I'm going to focus on my career. So I went to Randy and Fenton in January of 91. <laughs> and they were just starting up World of Wonder. Oh. And uh, they said, well, we, why don't we manage you? I said, let's do it. So Amazing. I, I took, a, uh, this is January of, of 91. I took that year to um, work on a demo tape and to uh, get myself together. So by March of 92 this mm-hmm. is a year later i got a record deal a big record deal so you you just cold turkey stopped doing drugs mm-hmm. well i mean i smoked weed but i stopped doing yeah chemicals. but i mean chemicals yeah because i was doing <laughs> how did you survive that well you know the, well you are protected you well, do have I, guardian oh, I, angels oh, you I have am. spirit guides because you maybe shouldn't have survived all that child i you ain't never lied i definitely <laughs> the um, the amount of cars i've gotten into of people who i do not know oh, the amount of my times goodness. i'm in a i'm in a, i was in a club and somebody said open your mouth and put a pill or something oh, in my no. mouth and i said okay let's party oh, no. and then saying um by the way what was that <laughs> the amount of times i've done that you have no idea i have no idea mm-hmm. yeah Yep, yep. So I quit doing chemicals. I continued to smoke weed, which was still a problem, but I was focused on my career in a way that, uh, in a way that I know how to. I'm very. You were hyper focused. You were hyper focused about it. But can I can just imagine your guardian angels and spirit guides scattering, going, "Wait, close your mouth. Don't have them take that pill. That they they had their hands full with you. They certainly did." You know, Henry I Tuck, think they still do, by the way. Oh, they certainly do. <laughs> you know what? I have been pulled over drunk driving so many times back then as a kid in my 20s. And um, once I was I was working as a go-go dancer at a club in Atlanta called Weekends. Mm-hmm. Um, I was actually the only go-go dancer at this club. <laughs> oh, so no. I got to work and um, the DJ uh, said, oh, I've got some acid. Because all through my 20s, I would drop acid at least once a week. Oh, my. And... Um, uh, he, we dropped, he, me, the, it was early in the night. So it was like seven, actually eight o'clock. It was still light outside. Uh-huh. So 
we said, let's go out back of the club. He put a long record on. Let's go out back, smoke a joint, and drop some acid. It's fine. So while we were smoking the joint, the cops rolled up and said, <gasps> drop it. Had put us in the oh, back. No. The, the record's still going in the disco, by the way. <laughs> put us in the back of the car. And then this other guy drives up, and, he, and he's an off-duty cop on the payroll of the club. And he said, oh. these guys are fine. They're okay. Um, uh -huh. Let them let them go. Oh, my. But the cop said, well, I've already started the process. So after your shift tonight, you guys are going to have to go downtown. Oh, no. And, um, and see, and we've written a citation. We had to go. Did you have to go to jail? We did not go. I've never been to jail in my life, Knockwood. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. We're never going to let you we do know, that. No, I'm never going to go never. to jail. Never. No. Never. So uh, anyway, <laughs> we finished our shift. I'm tripping my brains out on acid. Uh -huh. We both went downtown. We took the bus, the MARTA train downtown. We had to fill out some papers or something. But that ended up, they ended up letting us go and nothing ever came of that. So mm -hmm. I've never been arrested, but I've come very, very, very close. You have. Very close. But um, uh, yeah, guardian angels, absolutely. Well, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of those stories you hear of somebody said, like, the something took over the wheel and turned the wheel yes. so it saved them from yeah, being or, in a car accident. Or lifted, lifted the car you up. up from yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. You have miracles. You absolutely. have miracles. Absolutely. So you're so happy, aren't you? I am right now. What makes you happy? Uh, laughter, music, uh, creativity. I love sitting at a table with uh, the people I collaborate with. Uh -huh. And uh, um, and uh, coming up with something. Earlier, you asked me about how did Drag Race happen. Yeah. Um, Randy and Fenton oh, that's had right. been after me for years to do a reality show. And I thought, no, because I didn't want to do anything mean-spirited. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so fast forward to... Uh, 2000, actually 1999, when I got sober, I stepped away from the business. Uh, I did. I worked. Oh. I worked, mm -hmm. but I stepped away. The, I wasn't ambitious about my career mm -hmm. as much as I was about being sober and finding my footing again and getting yeah. into sobriety. So, um, from 1999 to uh, on to all of 03, wow. I was focused on home. So I would have. Mm -hmm barbecues and parties oh. with no alcohol and just get to know my nieces and nephews and all that. Oh, that's so, so nice. It was very nice. So by 04, I was hungry again. I felt great. And I went back to work for Frankie Blue at uh, oh, a news station. My goodness. And he hired both Michelle Visage and I to come and be at his news station. Where w was that? In New York. I was in L.A., what what, uh, what call W N E W oh W N E W yes yes and so Michelle and I uh, went back there but after about three months he got fired oh so um, I, I I decided to do this gig because I made a new record I was ready to come back and after Frankie Blue got fired I decided you know what I don't want to be there with the new management Michelle mm -hmm. stayed I left. I just said, oh. you know what? Um, Randy said, well, why don't you do a new Star Booty movie? Oh. Star Booty keeps coming up again and again and again. It's a constant. Uh, and I thought, that's a great idea. And I've always used Randy. Randy's the one who's who I could see my future in his eyes. Right. Um, I've always used him. Such a nice man. He's a lovely man. So sweet, so sensitive, and smart, 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 smart. Right. I've used both Randy and Fenton, Fenton. as uh, that mirror image that you were talking mm -hmm. about. I equate it to um, uh, is it Perseus in Clash of the Titans. I may have the r name r right or wrong. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But he goes to slay, um, take the head of Medusa. But if you look at Medusa in the eyes, mm -hmm. you'll turn to stone. Right. So he realizes that his shield is reflective. So he uses his shield to not look at her directly, but to use the shield, the reflection, to cut her head off. So, and he succeeds. So mm -hmm. I have used Randy as a reflection right. ever since the Marriott Marquis. I listen closely to what he says, and yes. he can see he can see me. There's, there's only one of us here. He can see me from outside. I could see myself through Randy's eyes. And who found Tom Campbell to work with Tom you? Tom Campbell, we met. Uh, I they've always known him. Tom Campbell is a producer of Drag Race. In fact, and the concept of Drag Race in, was his. 
It was his. Yes. He's a genius. He's a genius. Reading Queens with Char Margolis was his idea. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, so Tom Campbell is in your ear yeah. all the time. The whole time. On Drag Race, right? On Drag Race. I don't read a teleprompter. I have him, I have an earbud that, that transmits his voice right. into my ear. So the way I'm talking right now, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, um, he, he could be reading it to me and it sounds just like what but you're very talking. good at interpreting I'm very good at it. it i'm very it, good it's I, i've tried amazing with, i've tried with other people and i've done it with other people but no one is as good with it because we are simpatico he he's a genius he's a genius he's a genius yeah i'm telling you the guy he used to be an executive at abc that's when i met him yes well when i met him he was, i think he was an executive at mtv or something this is like 300 years yeah, ago. yeah exactly so uh, so f- after I did the Star Booty movie, Randy and Fenton thought, okay, he's serious about coming back. Yes. Because I wrote and produced the Star Booty movie. He's serious about coming back. And then they reapproached me about a reality show. And I said, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I'm ready. As long as it's not mean-spirited. How many years ago was that? That was, um, Star Booty came out in 07 and at the end of 07. And then we went out pitching Drag Race at the beginning of... Oh eight, mm-hmm. because we started filming it in on Labor Day of oh eight, and it started airing in January or February of oh nine, and wow. we just finished filming our twelfth season of that show. Twelve. Oh, by the way, mm. congratulations! Thank You're up you. for fourteen Emmys. Yeah, yeah. Mazel tov. Thank you. That's incredible. Yes. It is incredible. <laughs> I mean, it's very incredible. So exciting. When when does that come out? When do those? Well, tomorrow are the tomorrow are the um, creative uh, arts Emmys tomorrow, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then the following week, uh, next Sunday or something, those are the primetime Emmys. So we we're in both both of those uh, events. So tomorrow I'll go. <clears throat> so if you could give advice to the kids out there who are living in, you know, there's so many unhappy people. Yeah, yeah. What advice can you give them? Because you were down in the dumps at one time. Oh, yeah. And t- what time is it? I could be down in the dumps uh, this afternoon. <laughs> no, we're you not know. letting you. Well, no, I'm, I'm not right now. But I'm living <laughs> in this moment. But, uh, you know, I'm a sweet, sensitive soul. And that is yes, you the are. price we pay. He really is. I'm telling you, this man re- truly is a sweet, sensitive soul. Yeah, well... It's, you know, I, and and I'm honored that you're here because I know you don't like to do a lot of these interviews. So, what kind of advice can you give to somebody who's maybe having a hard time? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. First, um, advice: hard time or no hard time, you have to know thyself. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't come up with this stuff. I didn't come up with any of this stuff. What I'm doing is I'm remembering what the ascended masters, what the people who have lived before, right. what they've done, and I'm following their path. So first, know thyself. Mm-hmm. And that in, that entails um, realizing that you are an extension of the power that created this universe. Right. And well, in this body, you are, you're a, a very fragile little baby. Right. You know? And yeah. it's important for you to understand that that you are fragile, you have a, a sweet, beautiful heart, but you are. there's another part of you that is also part of the universe, the, 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 the part that created this universe. Now, I just want to quickly, you know, mm-hmm. go into this thing. I had a major breakthrough recently. Okay. And it was I'd love to hear it. And it's not, it's, it's something I already knew. It's something I had to remember, okay? You know, I spent... Um, Six months across the street over there at Warner Brothers. We are literally across the street from Warner Brother Burbank Studios. Mm-hmm. And I was filming uh, with Michael Patrick King, who whose birthday it is tomorrow, by oh, the way. Oh, thank you for telling me. Yeah. And, and can you talk about that? I will, yeah. Yeah, what's your your, your project? Yeah, uh, it's called AJ and the Queen. And I, I, I uh, my agent said, well, Rue, you're in a place where you could call any writer and write with them. Who right. do you want to write with? I said, oh, Michael Patrick King. Yeah. We met and... It was a marriage made in heaven, literally. I believe it. Yeah. And um, uh, so we put this project together called AJ and the Queen. And uh, after we filmed it, six months of filming, uh, we uh, someone asked me, well, what, what did you learn? What was it like filming with this 10-year-old kid? Is this the epiphany that you're yes. telling me about? Okay. What was it like? I said, well, you know. It was like being able to reparent my 10-year-old self. Oh. And I thought, oh my goodness, did I create 
a situation to reparent my 10 year old? I absolutely did. And in doing that, um, uh, I have created and uh, um, beautified and solidified this relationship with my 10 year old. Because after we finished filming for six months, I could still feel uh, Izzy G, the kid, uh-huh. I could feel her right here. In fact, her I energy. F- her energy. Because we were side by side the whole time, like Siamese twins. The whole time, we're in every scene together, and we love each other. So, so exciting. After I left the set, I could still feel her presence there. And now, when I feel it, I think of my 10-year-old kid, oh. who, by the way, I was 10 years old when I started smoking weed and started doing drugs oh. and all that stuff. And I got, I've got to say... And I've been sober for 20 years. Um, those drugs, the, the, they saved my life. It saved my life. Mm-hmm. Okay, the last 10 years of it, not so much. <laughs> but, you know, because I used it for 29 years. Um, um, uh, so wow. in doing this show, this this series for Netflix, it's called AJ and the Queen, I, I could feel my 10-year-old next to me. And my 10-year-old throughout my life had always been looking for I've been look I had been looking for people to um, parent my 10 year old right but I realized in doing the show the only person my 10 year old wanted to parent me mm-hmm. was me Aww. the only person now I wanted my father to do it I wanted my mother to do it they couldn't do it no uh, I wanted uh, relationships to do it other people right? life you know whoever in, in reigniting my relationship with my 10-year-old, my 10-year-old said, no, no, Rue, I want you. Oh. I want you. That was major for me. And so it let other people off the hook because other people could sense, you want me to look after a 10-year-old? Right. I don't want to, I don't want to look after a 10-year-old. It's a to- too much, too right. tall in order. Right. Meanwhile, that this was a major, 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 major breakthrough for me. Now, is it, when you hear it, it's like, well, of course, Rue. You know, it wasn't something I had to learn. It was something mm-hmm. I had to remember. So when I, when I, when you ask about advice for young people who are mm-hmm. out there, mm-hmm. Knowing thyself and knowing all parts of yourself, Mm -hmm. knowing that child who is right there with you. Right. It's right there. Right. You have to create a relationship. You have to reignite a relationship Mm -hmm. with that child Mm -hmm. and take care of that child. Because Mm -hmm. if I was literally and, you know, during the filming of this thing, I felt very protective of this kid. Mm -hmm. She um, uh, Izzy, um, her parents were on the set all the time. She Mm -hmm. had a teacher. She had both Mm -hmm. her parents. It's great. But I was very, very protective because I love this kid. When you see this kid on camera, oh my goodness. So really your advice to people is what you always say. If you can't... Love yourself, how in the hell are you going to love somebody else? Yes. I That's right. I wanted him to say that on the show. That is absolutely <laughs> right. I can't... You, because you can't give them something you ain't got. Right. You can't give away something you ain't got. I cannot thank you enough for being here. I know you you're not crazy about doing interviews. I appreciate you trusting me. <laughs> I this is it's going to be a surprise, but Rue wrote the foreword to my new book that's going to be coming out. It's called um it's called What is it called? The Universe, the universe is, is calling, calling you. you. Thank you. And I'm so honored that you that you that you have allowed me to be part of your tribe. I love you so much. I love you too. Kindred spirits. Yeah, he's going to make me cry. You do. I ain't no pain. Ain't nothing wrong with crying. And then then I'm sitting here thinking, am I supposed to call you he or she? You can call me whatever you want. It doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter. No, everything is everything. Well, I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to you for everything that you do for everybody else and the healing work that you do. And I, I, I will... I've put you I put you in my prayers this morning. I will keep you in my prayers. Good. And 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 me yours. Thank and you. yours mine or something like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. And when does the Netflix show come out? We we haven't they haven't said yet. Okay. I know, but I can't say okay. on broadcast. Okay. okay. Well you guys watch for it. It's called AJ and the Queen. AJ and the Queen. Yeah. And um here's okay, so all my Shar visionaries, thank you so much for watching and listening. And you know that I love you and I'm so grateful to you. And I'm keeping all of you guys in my prayers too.
God bless you. Be well. And remember, intuition will take you places logic never could. That's right. Bye-bye. everybody. It's Sunny and Shar, and I am so excited. I am over the moon to share with you that I have a new book coming out called The Universe is Calling You. And there's an amazing forward by RuPaul. There's an endorsement by Chris Colfer. It's about understanding your in- intuition. It's about protecting yourself from negative energies. It's about understanding your essence and your true purpose and your soul's purpose on this earth. You can get it at barnesandnoble.com. You can get it at amazon.com. I would love for you to order the book and let me know what you think of it. Write a review for us if you feel like it. Thanks so much.